Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off by telling you about the uh, findings of our report published on Tuesday. Uh, but to start off, we're going to begin with what the research questions that we looked at were and then what our methods were and explain a bit about those. We were asking ourselves the overarching question, um, is there anything that can be improved about the inspection system as it currently stands? And is there anything we can learn about that from the data uh, that Ofsted publishes about its inspection judgments combined with data from the National Pupil Database? So we decided to set ourselves two questions from this. The first one was, how does Ofsted respond when schools deteriorate? And the second one was about how equitable inspection judgments are for schools with different pupil intakes. So on that first question, uh, we looked at, at two parts to that. How quickly are schools reinspected if their performance deteriorates according to the statistics um, that, that are held? And then when schools are reinspected, but they have deteriorated between two inspections, uh, how is that reflected in the inspection judgment um, that results from that? And on the second question uh, about equity for schools with different intakes, we have looked at two different types of pupil intake in particular. We've looked at the proportions of pupils eligible for free school meals within the school and also at the proportions of pupils with low prior attainment. By low prior attainment, we mean those who were in the bottom quarter nationally uh, of prior attainment when they entered the school. Um, so how did we go about this? Uh, our methods were, first of all, to do a complete system analysis. So what I mean by this is we have gathered together the inspection records for uh, all schools. Uh, we have linked back together schools uh, where there has been a change such as becoming a sponsored academy, amalgamation, etc. So we've linked all the records back together so that uh, we can see the full history of schools because what we're interested in here is how the inspection system works rather than what schools do we currently have in the system. And um, we've done this to avoid a systematic exclusion of schools that are particularly low uh, performing, which can happen. If we don't link those schools back together, then um, schools will be excluded where they have closed and the new provision has not yet been reinspected. Um, there's also a second reason for doing that. Um, we look across nine years from 2005-06 to 2014-15 uh, because we want the analysis to be representative of how the Ofsted uh, inspection system treats all schools. And if we look within a more limited range of time, then what we will find, particularly in more recent years, is that we're not getting the full range of schools. Because of the way Ofsted's inspection arrangements work, um, the schools that are inspected in the more recent years are not necessarily typical of all schools. So uh, the second principle for our analysis was uh, making sure our comparisons were meaningful by always looking within uh, a particular school phase because the distributions of Ofsted judgments are quite different for infant schools, primary schools and secondary schools and always breaking down far enough to look at uh, every outcome according to what the previous inspection grade was because the probability of a different outcome uh, does depend on what grade the school previously was at their earlier inspection. So when we look at um, deterioration of schools and how Ofsted responds to this, we've decided to take a conservative definition of deterioration. We didn't want to pick up trivial cases and we didn't want to pick up cases where what we're actually looking at is volatility in schools results over time which we know can occur um, so we decided to use a method where we were looking at the rank position of schools within the national distribution over time and how far that position moves or stays the same and we have defined schools as having deteriorated substantially where they've moved at least 15 percentiles downwards per year when I say per year, uh, we do analyses of how long schools have waited since their most recent inspection. So it's 15 percentiles per year for each year since their most recent inspection. And we do analyses of uh, what's happened to inspection judgments between the latest and previous inspection. In that case, it's 15 percentiles per year on average across all the years between the latest and previous inspections. Um, so what this means in terms of the size of the change is that we are looking at a, a 
size of change that's big enough to move a school from either the top to the middle of the national distribution in three years, or from the middle to the bottom, or for a school to go from the best school nationally to the worst in around six to seven years. So it is quite a large uh, deterioration that we're looking at, and I hope not a trivial one. Uh, we've also disregarded volatile results by uh, excluding cases where schools had seen a large fall in a single year within the last two years because we don't know particularly what might happen to their results in the next couple of years so we've excluded them where there hasn't been enough time to see whether in fact the results are about to bounce back. So those are the methods that we've used. Um, before we go into the findings, I think it's important to say a few words about the limitations of the analysis. We are, of course, only looking at data and not at everything that Ofsted has seen when it goes into schools to conduct inspections. And Ofsted judgments rightly take into account lots of ground level information um, that's not visible through our data and that we can't see, um, factors such as child protection, which might mean a school that has excellent academic results is not in fact outstanding overall. Um, we can't assess the validity of an individual uh, inspection judgment using the data in this way. What we try to do in this research is to look at whether the numbers and the patterns are consistent with an effective inspection system and how plausible the patterns we see are uh, within that. So uh, another important point um, that we touch on in terms of how long it is since outstanding schools have been inspected, um, there is... Uh, of course, a, a statutory provision that means that outstanding schools are exempted from routine reinspection, uh, which Ofsted isn't able to change. Um, however, there is the possibility of using Section 8 inspections following a risk assessment of a school, and we do include Section 8 judgments that have been deemed Section 5 within our analysis, so cases where that has happened is included. Um, so the final point on limitations is around patterns of uh, socioeconomic gradient in the Ofsted judgments. Um, there are, of course, many reasons why there might be real socioeconomic gradients in terms of the uh, quality of, of learning that goes on in schools and, and the outcomes from those schools. Um, so the question we're asking is really whether the observed gradient is plausible and we are using observed pupil progress within the schools to inform our thoughts about this. Um, so one of the questions we might ask is, is it plausible for a school to be outstanding uh, where the pupil progress within the school does not seem to be consistent with that judgment? Whatever else is going on within the school, do we think it's plausible? OK, so I'm going to start to take you through the findings now. Um, and the first thing that we looked at there on the question of deterioration was Ofsted's uh, response in terms of how long it is uh, since the latest inspection for schools which have deteriorated substantially under those definitions that I just described. Um, and what we found was 177 primary schools and 20 secondary schools that had deteriorated substantially since their last inspection. They were all good and outstanding schools. There were no... Uh, requires improvement or inadequate schools within that group. This is a very small proportion of all schools. It's not a large number of schools given the, the total size of the system that Ofsted is looking at. And what we found was that they have waited average times, mostly around three to four years uh, since their most recent inspection. So what we conclude from this is that those schools are neither being neglected within the inspection system and, and, and left, to, uh, left behind, but nor are they being prioritised and pushed straight to the front of the queue. Um, we're looking at primary schools on the chart here, but the pattern is extremely similar for secondary schools. So moving on now to look at um, what happens when schools have been reinspected. So their uh, performance in terms of value-added progress has deteriorated uh, between their, mo their previous inspection and their latest inspection. And what are the chances that uh, the judgment will be downgraded for a school in that position? So we found... Uh, about 1,200 primary schools and just over 200 secondary schools that had deteriorated substantially between their last two inspections. Um, and of these, 
962 of the primary schools and 152 of the secondary schools were not downgraded uh, despite their value-added uh, progress having decreased substantially. Um, so what we're seeing there, if we look at the outstanding schools, we're looking at primary schools again on this chart. Um, there were only 64 schools that were outstanding primary schools that then deteriorated substantially between their last two inspections, but around a third of those were re-rated as outstanding and, and not downgraded. Um, and these were only fractionally more likely than other schools which did not deteriorate in their value-added progress uh, to be downgraded. And looking at the good category, um, two-thirds of the 406 uh, good primaries which had substantially deteriorated on their value added uh, had not been downgraded. Um, so stepping back and looking at this overall, uh, what we found was that 47% of the primaries and 33% of secondaries that had deteriorated substantially in their academic performance um, actually improved their Ofsted judgment at the next inspection. So um, that's 541 primaries and 68 secondaries. So again, we look at the primary schools here. Um, if we looked at secondary schools, you would see that there is a greater chance of the judgments being downgraded in all cases. Um, but, and also that there is a bigger difference between schools that were deteriorating according to their value-added progress and schools that weren't. Um, so we look at primary schools here where the pattern is most interesting. So we're now going to move on to the second question that's about equity of Ofsted judgments uh, for schools with different types of intakes and with more challenging intakes in particular. Um, so... What we found, we're looking here at secondary schools rather than primary schools because the most start patterns occur in secondaries for this question. Um, and what you're looking at the chart on the screen is uh, schools broken down by the proportion of children eligible for free school meals with those with the fewest FSM pupils in the bar on the left and those with the most FSM pupils in the bar on the right. Um, so what we found was a systematic negative correlation between schools with more disadvantaged children and more favourable Ofsted judgments. Um, we found, in fact, that the lowest uh, FSM secondaries were over three times as likely to be graded outstanding uh, as those with the highest number uh, proportion sorry, of FSM pupils. So 48% of schools with the lowest proportion of FSM pupils were outstanding compared with 14% of schools with uh, the highest percent of FSM pupils. Uh, we also found that schools with the highest FSM rates uh, were more likely to be rated inadequate uh, than schools with the lowest rates. Uh, this was 15% compared with 1% for the extreme groups on the end of the chart there. Um, so we also found looking at changes in Ofsted judgments that the least deprived schools were most likely to improve between inspections and the least likely to be downgraded between inspections. Um, so, we, as I say, we show secondary schools here. If we looked at infant schools, you would see uh, many fewer requires improvement in inadequate schools across the board. Uh, and if we looked at primaries, uh, the gradient is not as steep. You'll see that on the next slide, uh, but it, it is there. So I'll just take a moment to explain to you what's going on in the four charts on the screen here. Um, what we have is the top row showing you the actual Ofsted distribution as in the previous chart and the lower row there showing you what Ofsted judgments would be look like if would look like if they were based purely on value added progress so looking at the mean value added progress scores uh, for all years between the latest two inspections. Um, by the way, I should say that we're not suggesting that's how inspections should actually be conducted. This is to inform our thinking about what we're seeing and the plausibility of that um, being a good reflection of school performance. Um, so we've allocated schools into categories that are the same size as Ofsted grades overall uh, and, and looked at there what the pattern would look like. Um, and what we found is that the distribution of inadequate grades looks to be fair on the basis of value adding, but the distribution of outstanding grades does not look 
to reflect the uh, value-added progress that's going on in those schools. So if we were looking at, at this base purely on VA, we'd expect half as many low FSM outstanding schools and we'd expect roughly twice as many high FSM outstanding schools. Now, it's important to remember from our limitations, not all aspects of school effectiveness are captured by value-added progress. Um, so, in some ways, I think it's more interesting to think about the results where we have cases of outstanding schools where the value-added uh, progress appears to be lower, and it's more likely that there are other things going on in cases where schools are not rated outstanding but do have very high value-added progress. We can't see that, unfortunately, within the data. Okay, so those are just uh, indicative numbers, um, but if you want to know what that would look like in terms of the number of schools, the value-added uh, distribution suggests that there, would, there are about 132 many secondaries and 382 many primaries in the lowest FSM band that are rated outstanding. And with the caveats we've just mentioned uh, about unobserved factors, that we're missing about 50 secondaries and 310 primaries in the outstanding category for the highest FSM schools. So here we are looking at the same analysis, but for uh, schools according to the proportion of pupils who are low prior attainers. Uh, and what we can see is there's a, a very similar pattern to the FSM analysis that we just looked at. So I won't labour those points, but we'll move on finally to look at some implications from the findings. So our first implication is the possible impacts on recruitment and retention for schools with challenging intakes. Um, and this could impact on the distribution of high quality teachers and leaders that are available to schools and therefore what happens to them next. Um, so I think there's a danger of a self-fulfilling prophecy there um, given the current distribution of Ofsted grades. Um, the second potential implication is that we apparently, and with all the caveats we've mentioned, seem to be missing some opportunities for current leaders of schools with challenging intakes, as Russell said, to actually uh, contribute to system leadership and gain fair recognition. And that also leads, as you mentioned, to an uneven geographic distribution of system leaders and difficulties in finding sufficient numbers of system leaders in certain parts of the country. Uh, our third potential implication is the possibility of distorting parental choices of which schools to apply for places at for uh, their children. Um, and this could potentially encourage increased social segregation because what we have is a pattern of results that leads people to believe that high FSM schools in some way equate to a poor quality education and the value added progress analysis suggests that this is certainly not as much the case or always the case at all. Um, so this could be particularly misleading to disadvantaged parents because when we look at any judgment that reflects the overall uh, performance of the school, uh, for, particularly for pupils looking at, uh, sorry, for parents looking at schools with very few disadvantaged children, if they themselves are disadvantaged, then they're essentially looking at the results for other people's children <coughs> and not for their own children. So it can be particularly misleading for disadvantaged parents if we have a system that assumes that um, schools that are uh, heavily disadvantaged are more likely to offer a poor quality education. Um, our fourth uh, implication is the potential opportunity to actually increase and strengthen the incentives for excellence within schools with the least challenging intakes um, that, that follows from those schools which uh, don't appear to be outstanding based on their value added progress but have been judged outstanding. and. Um, Arguably, there isn't a strong incentive for them to push harder to improve, at least through uh, the Ofsted inspection process. And finally, uh, we think there's a risk of a potential build-up of outstanding schools being insulated from prompt intervention in the event that they uh, deteriorate substantially. We saw from our analysis that there are not large numbers of schools currently in that position but as we go forward and more schools becoming out outstanding, the risk increases that the number of schools in that position and deteriorating but not being re-inspected could increase. Um, okay, so that concludes our discussion of the findings of uh, 
Tuesday's report. So I'm now going to hand over to EPI's Chief Economist, Peter Sellant, and he's going to talk to you about uh, some interesting thoughts on workforce issues and Ofsted. Then we'll move on to a joint Q&A across both of those sessions.